So we might move on to the, all the objective aspects of a, a knee examination. And, yeah. and what we decided we'd really try to hit on are yeah. the differences in that examination between the sort of adult patient and the, the paediatric or adolescent yeah. knee yeah. patient. Yeah, so we really wanted to add to the other sort of learned physio resources rather than rehash it and just sort of look at those nuances for the, mm. for the adolescent. I think like most um, knee examinations, uh, we start with gait. And mm. our model here is, is uh, exhibiting a, a normal gait. And what you really should take from this is, is look at the rate, the rhythm, um, the balance of that gait. Uh, you look really from head to toe, looking for any abnormal movements or particularly side to side translations of shoulders, uh, up and down translation of shoulder consistent with a short leg gait. The next video demonstrates a pathological gait and hopefully most of you see the pathology here is centered around the uh, left knee uh, which has been fused for treatment of a uh, sarcoma. So this is a, quite an, an unusual case. As you can see just to demonstrate uh, this patient is exhibiting a bolting gait over the uh, stiff knee because they can't flex the knee to allow clearance during that swing phase of gait. If we go then to the paediatric knee examination, I've just on my slide written hip, 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 and that is the first thing you need to do is exclude pathology of the hip. All I do is a passive straight leg raise, do that very gently because if they do have some serious pathology in the hip, um, you don't want to hurt the patient. And then full range of internal and external rotation in flexion go to the extremes of those ranges and then just force a little bit more. If you have a very stable, slipped upper femoral epiphysis, which is really the key diagnosis here you're trying to exclude, then it may not be that painful until you get to a full range of internal rotation. We then sort of move on to the knee exam and this starts very much like the adult exam with um, palpation of um, tender points. You move around the anterior aspects and anterior structures of the knee, the joint um, lines, and uh, any other aspect that you might feel is necessary. So it's very similar to the adult mm -hmm. uh, knee exam, as is the ligamentous testing. Um, I'm demonstrating a McMurray's test here. I mean, meniscal pathology is very common, particularly in the sporting athlete. Uh, and then you move on to uh, ligamentous testing, which can include your ACL tests, anterior draw, Lachman's and pivot shift test uh, and also uh, ligaments as required or might seem indicated depending on your mechanism of injury. Um, this girl he, is a good example actually of how lax adolescent ligaments, particularly in the young ladies, can be. Um, I don't know if you could appreciate that anterior draw and Lachman's mm -hmm. test look quite yeah. positive. So I make the point here that you really do have to compare to the contralateral side um, to make sure that you're not sort of overcalling those, those clinical tests. The other thing that I think is really pertinent in your examination of, of um, these adolescents with, particularly with anterior knee pain, is their rotational profile. I like to do this in the prone position. Um, we sort of use the tibia as a goniometer to assess internal and external rotation. If there's an excessive amount of femoral antiversion, then you'll get a frame shift of your rotation range. So you get this massive range of internal rotation, and sometimes you can place the lateral aspect of the foot on the couch. Um, you compare that with their external rotation range, which we um, sort of, as a, as a complement, reduced. Um, and that can lead to issues with the patellofemoral joint in particular. The other way to assess that is to then look at your uh, tibial version. So I look at the um, foot progression angle, the foot thigh angle, and also the intermillular axis. Uh, we stabilize the pelvis there with my left hand and use, again, the tibia as a goniometer to assess rotation. This is an example of the trochanteric angle, which is essentially palpating the lateral aspect of the trochanter, finding where it's most prominent and then using again the tibia as a goniometer to assess the femoral neck shaft antiversion angle. In the same sort of, um, in the same aspect as uh, rotation, the patellofemoral joint's really important mm -hmm. in the adolescent. Uh, I like to assess active knee extension to look at 
how that patella is tracking. Um, you want to look at whether it's jumping into the trochlear groove, coming from that fully extended position to the flexed position. Then you're looking at more so, more so the uh, ligamentous um, tests for lateral patella glide. A normal is sort of less than two quarters. Um, and then we sort of assess how that patella travels as you flex and extend the knee. So mm -hmm. this would include an apprehension sign. Um, you're always watching the patient's face mm -hmm. when you do that. Uh, often the quadriceps will contract to stop that patella gliding too laterally. And then an apprehension sign as you flex the knee, I think is a good one, trying to dislocate essentially yeah. the patella. I just want to put these slides up because there's a, there's a fair bit of work being done on uh, research uh, with respect to rotational alignment and what impact that has on the knee joint. Something we really have ignored. I mean, we've done a lot of work on coronal plane and sagittal mm -hmm. plane alignment, but not rotational mm -hmm. alignment. And in, uh, in some of the work we've done so far, it looks like there is an impact on joint loading when you have excessive femoral antiversion. Mm -hmm. Likewise, we're trying to uh, create a secondary kinematic model for patella uh, dislocation. And so far we've sort of succeeded in getting that model and validating it amongst normal and dislocating uh, patients. So there'll be more work to, to go there. I think you've got some nice videos of Baton School. Yes, yes. Show that? I'll um, bring those up. So with the Baton's score, so we're just looking at um, ligament laxity. So the first one is basically just looking at her in standing and looking at the hyperextended knees. Um, now, a model surprisingly doesn't hyperextend her knees, um, but anything past zero would be considered hyperextending. And then, then the next part is your forward flexion test and whether they can put their um, hands flat on the floor and our model can't do that. The next one is looking at the elbows and whether she can um, hyperextend her elbows, which she can, and then looking at um, the hands to the wrist, um, the thumb to the wrist, and then the little finger going back. So basically we're giving them a, a score, so there's one for the lumbar spine, two for the knees, two for the wrists, and two for, for the finger. So giving a score out of seven. And it's it's important to to just have an understanding of the ligament laxity, and particularly around the knee as well. Um, and that along with their muscle control, okay? Because yeah. if they've got, okay, ligament lax, if they've got a lot of ligament, ligament laxity that can control it, that's okay and that can be advantageous for some sports. But if they've got really lax ligaments and, and no control. muscle control, then yeah. that's, that's a problem. I mean, yeah. I look for that because if I'm going to harvest a hamstring mm. or use another aspect of their collagen to reconstruct something that's been ruptured, yeah. I want to know that that collagen is of sufficient quality to do the job. Yeah, And exactly. if you've got poor quality collagen, then you might add things to your algorithm reinforce with synthetic ligament or uh, brace for longer yeah. you know those sorts of things can yeah. come into play yeah and I just had a um, video here that we can or two videos here that we can look at as well when we're talking about posture is just um, that protective posture that we see a lot um, so some good acting here by <laughs> our model um, but I'm sure everyone will have seen those patients that really come in and are really overprotective of their injury. Um, and just typically when they um, come in, they're, they're limping or they're not putting weight through that. And then when they're sitting there talking to you, their leg is really s sitting out. It's not actually with the other mm -hmm. one. And it's, and it's almost like they've separated it from their That's body right, yeah. in a sense. And then we've just got the other one when she's getting on and off the bed and really holding that leg up rather than lifting it, it itself. So I usually point out those, you know, as part of my um, treatment, I will usually actually point that out and make them really aware of that because quite, quite often they're never aware of that, but if they're not aware of it, they can't actually address it. Address it. And um, we're lucky enough to have a sports psychologist at um, the clinic and I've, and. I've treated a lot of these patients with them as well and, and sometimes I would think, oh, should I just distract and see if I can actually get a bit of weight on them? 
Um, but talking to the psychologist is actually more about getting them to actually acknowledge that they're doing that and making a cognitive decision to actually put some weight on it. And that's where, you know, it's really important to make sure that there's no reason for them not to put weight on, but if they if they can, to get that early weight bearing as well. And I just had a few other slides here that we're going to talk about. It's just that um, pain re response. We've sort of touched on this a little bit, but we may as well bring up that complex regional pain syndrome um, now. And we, and I guess when we learn at physio school about um, complex regional pain syndrome, neuropathic pain, it was sort of more upper limb, and in adults it is upper limb, mm. but in children and adolescents it's actually eight to one lower limb to mm. upper limb. So this is something we'll see quite quite a lot. We see it in the ankle injuries a lot, but also in the knee injuries, and it's more common in females. So seven to one females to male, and I think with adults it might be two to one female mm. to male, but it's certainly much more female based in the children and, and adolescents. So that's something that we always need to be aware of um, and in the management of that it's the management and prevention is pretty much the same early weight bearing early functional movement is really critical mm. um, and I've I guess I've seen a few patients where they have seen a physio or a doctor early on and because they just really do not want to put weight through it, you've been really concerned and then sent them off for lots of imaging, you've really medicalised it. So I guess the one thing I would say is just take your time with those patients and sometimes I find just saying to them, you know, are you really worried about putting weight on it? You're really worried about something or is it something that's scaring mm -hmm. you? And just using terms like that, which they would understand, mm -hmm. and then um, they'll go, well, actually, yeah. and. So then we can actually talk through it and go, well, actually, it's pretty safe to do this, or do you want to hold my hand while you do it, or give them some kind of extra support so that they can do it, so that then I know, well, actually, if, I, if you take a bit of time, you can put weight on. So, you know, maybe that's not the fracture that you were thinking of, and maybe yeah. we don't need to go down that whole medical... Yeah, um, I couldn't agree way. more. I think, I think um, early recognition is the key there mm -hmm. um, for, for a, a, a higher likelihood of a successful outcome. Mm -hmm with what is relatively simple treatment in the end, but sometimes you see these kids go down a very vicious spiral, mm. uh, needing to see pain clinics uh, on medication. Yeah. And that's one thing that you really want to mm -hmm. avoid. I do think that sometimes imaging can be useful, particularly an MRI scan. It's no radiation, mm -hmm. there's really no disadvantage to that, except for, I guess, the financial mm -hmm. cost. But it allows you to objectify your um, advice yeah. You, know, you can look at that scan and say to the adolescent, there is nothing here that's serious. Sure, you've injured yourself, but we think this is going to be fine. Yeah. And give them permission to get better. Yeah. Because sometimes, you're right, they get in this cycle that they've been told not to wait yeah. there on it. They've got this horrible injury. And that's the advice that they're adhering to until mm -hmm. you trump it. And sometimes an MRI scan can help you yeah, trump that Yeah, advice. I would actually agree with that. Um, so the ones that I've seen that have come with an MRI, but it's it's often taken four to eight weeks to get that. Yeah. They've had four to eight weeks of yeah. non-weight bearing. And then you've got it, you go, actually, there's no reason why you can't do that. And sometimes it it might be putting a bit of tape on to give them support or, or give them something else. But to be able to say on a scan, look, there's nothing wrong. But hopefully we could do that sooner than mm. eight weeks. I've, I've put here as well the social context mm. of that and I with different sports the social context is really different and with the netball club that I was that I work with um, last year we um, sat down with all the coaches for the rep team when we were going away because what I was finding was that whenever there was an injury unlike most other sports all the players would huddle around that person and they all the players would give advice to that person to that injured player and as the physio often you're going can you just get out of the way can you stand back so I can have a look at it and and what would happen is that they would say don't move don't move and they would get carried off and all this and speaking to those um, teenagers that have had that injury they often say I was actually feeling okay until everyone came and said don't move it and then I thought 
oh my God, is there something really bad? And so that social context. And then I find as well, they, when they come home, the parents are getting everything for them and they're allowed to be just on the couch and don't move it, don't move it, I will do everything. And particularly with girls, more than boys, gross generalisation, mm. I know, but... True. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. The girls, I find, their friends really want to help them out and there's this competition to be see who can be the best nurse yes. and carry yeah. their books and yep. everything. Whereas the boys, you know, like we're often giving them a crutch so that they're not bumped at school or something. It's it's really quite mm. different, um, and so that whole social context can yeah, sort of yeah. so feed that predisposition into it. to catastrophize. Yeah, um, yeah. I see that. Obviously, I'm not on the netball court, yeah. but I see that with the MRI scan report. Now, oh, yeah. after saying it's a good idea, uh, of late patients can access their own report. Mm. And those reports are often um, full of technical language, of course, um, which is again prone to be um, overinflated in its yeah. importance. You know, uh, the, the commonest example is the radiologist reporting uh, mi microtrabecular fracture, mm. and that happens in the knee and the ankle. Now, um, I spend a bit of time explaining to the patients that that's actually not a fracture as they might understand it, where the bone is broken. Mm -hmm. Um, it's basically a bit of bone bruising that occurs as a, a result of the ankle sprain or the contusion that's occurred um, with the knee injury. Um, and once they have that explained, there's, you see their faces change and you see that uh, some of that anxiety mm. are laid. Um, it's the same thing. Yeah, so it's, yeah, back to language and mm. things, yeah. And um, Peter O'Sullivan, who's no relation, but um, a great physio in Perth, he talks with low back pain about um, imaging and how damaging and contestorizing imaging in the, and the reports mm. can be and how you know perhaps we should have like the pathology where you say the percentages in different age groups which are what's what's the normal range um, on that and um, yeah so so it can be useful but also just the, just the language I guess is, is really important um, and yeah, and the other thing that we should touch on is just compliance as well, because I think when people say to me, oh, you work with teenagers, you, you see that sort of eye roll and it's just like, that's so difficult. And it's the compliance issue. Um, so for me, it's that transition again and helping them to become an adult and take ownership of their own injury and that changing of the guard from being the parent completely responsible to them starting to be responsible and that transition where you're going to be a bit backwards and forwards um, still and using language that they understand and I think most teenagers would like to be more like an adult than like a child and so talking to them and treating them like a baby is just no. like a no-no um, and I often think with paediatric you know like because paediatrics is supposed to be up till 18 and no adolescent wants to be in an environment where there are little toys and baby things. <laughs> they would yeah. much prefer to be in the adult sort of realm um, there. So that's important. Um, and I like to get them involved. So like if we've got, um, if we're coming back from an overuse injury, I might be getting them to count their steps on their um, wearable device so that they can actually, object, you know, obviously it's not a great, like a perfect measure, but it is some kind of objective measure that they can record and they can see and mm. have some ownership of getting them to do diaries. And I don't get them to do diaries for absolutely everything all the time. No one would do that. But I might get them to do a diary for a very specific um, uh, reason. And quite often I use a diary so that they can see that oh, if I do this or if I do these many trainings or trainings on this service that aggravates it or flares it up whereas if I do this it doesn't and then they can come to me and we can have a discussion about um, how we're going to manage it like do we take this out or that out and yeah. they can see because they've written their own diary that this is what aggravates it so it makes sense to them um, to take that out using milestones so um, you know, as a parent of teen, I'm sure um, you nag, they get annoyed with the nagging and things, and 
it's really annoying for me when they come in, can I play it, can I play it? And then I can go, well, you've got this milestone. And, and quite often I'll break that back down again and go, okay, so what do you need to do to get back to sport? What are the components of sport like? So if they're in, on crutches, number one, they've got to be able to wait there. Number two, they've got to be able to walk normally and then we'll look at, you know, um, hopping and these kinds of things. So I'll get them, particularly those ones that are sporty and they're doing health and PE, to actually sort of, we might use this as an assignment, um, essentially, where they sort of break down the skill to its sort of components and then they are telling me, obviously I'm guiding them, about what um, is required. And so we'll have, well this will be your milestone. So if they come in, can I play it? Well, can you do this? And then it's like, that's the end of discussion yeah, and they know it. make it fairly concrete and, yeah. and not open for too much interpretation on their part. Yeah, but they're uh, the ones they're that have owning actually, it. Yeah, yeah. But, and they're yeah. the ones that have gone, well these are the yeah. milestones. Um, I will also, particularly those ones that are doing, are really interested in having a career in sport or sports medicine or doing PE at school and they can't do all of their assessments, I might get them to actually um, help me design the progressions and do that as an assignment for school as well so that can um, help them as well and modify training so we might be um, instead of me saying, well, you can add this in and this in, I might say, okay, well, what would you like to add in? So we can add in a different skill, we can add in more reps, more load, um, more frequency, more intensity, but we can only add in one. What do you want to do? Sure. And, and give them some ownership in making that decision. I'm obviously guiding them, but giving them choices as well and sort of limiting those choices, just, you know, parenting That's right. <laughs> really um, yeah so that yeah so I think that compliance is probably what a lot of people sort of struggle with with um, teenagers as well yeah